I'm here. Present. Councilmember Here. Councilmember Victoria. Here. Councilmember Victoria will not be here this evening. Are there any council comments? Councilmember Clay. Councilmember um, I had a question from a constituent this week that is nervous because she saw painted marks running up Ethan Allen, like in a long strip, indicating maybe that somebody's about to make some major cuts into the street in front of more than one house. Could we inquire and <coughs> see who's going to do did that? She, did she happen to know what color they are since that'll tell who it is? I think they're orange. Hmm. This street. Ethan Allen in the six, early 600 block at Ethan Allen? On the south side of the street, right close to Elm. <clears throat> the other thing is I wanted to thank everybody for the fruit basket that you all sent me. It was very nice. came from the Tacoma Park, Park Florist, and it was probably the, the freshest fruit I've ever had the entire six years that I've lived in Maryland, and it was great, and I even brought a pear to eat tonight. So I just want to thank you all. It was very thoughtful of you. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is about the Tacoma Park Elementary School. Um, I think I'm the only council member with a kid in the Tacoma Park Elementary School. And um, I think you'll remember last year when they came and they talked to us about the redevelopment of the elementary school and an element of that was that they were going to bus all of the kids to Bethesda to the holding school. And I, you may not remember this or not, but I was pretty unhappy about that and, and actually thinking about finding another alternative for my child because I wasn't really excited about the idea of her spending 45 minutes a day each direction on the bus. It's not really her best time of the day anyway. Um, and, you know, was pretty roundly chastised by the people in the PTA that I shouldn't use my, my money to vote myself out of the system when then there were other lower income people who couldn't do that. Um, so my child is there being bused every day to Tacoma Park Elementary School. Um, in spite of all kinds of advice from the PTA and my understanding all kinds of advice from the staff, the transportation folks at Montgomery County Public Schools didn't make a plan to send the people to Bethesda any different than what their plan is to send the kids from the neighborhood to whatever the address is on Holly Avenue every day. And so, as you could imagine, there are a lot of kids who don't walk to Tacoma Park Elementary School who used to, um, that in fact needed to be bused, and, and the school made essentially uh, no plans for that. Um, they, they actually, the, I think the first day they sent one bus to Piney Branch to pick up all the kids who walked in the collective area along Maple Avenue. Um, the first day the kids didn't get to school on some of the buses. I think my child got there at 10.53, and school starts at 9 a.m., um, the first couple of days, uh, I spent some time driving around uh, Tacoma Park looking for parents at the bus stop when their kids had gone to the school, and then kids got sent to bus stops when their parents were picking them up at school or they were supposed to be before care. Um, it was really a mess. They spent some time fixing it in the first week. They assigned superintendent. Uh, they, they assigned pe uh, people essentially to be on the buses, count heads, tried to get numbers. They did some positive things. They split some of the routes in half instead of just bringing two two buses on the same route, they actually then split the routes, and things got better. But they're actually still not going all that great because of um, the lack of supervision on the buses. And so, um, you know, they don't have the kinds of things that you might expect on a middle school bus, but uh, kindergarten through second grade, pretty rowdy. Uh, they still have some problems with the bus drivers who are sort of overwhelmed by having, it's like three kids across every single every single seat, so the buses are packed, and there's no supervision on the bus. And, and um, actually, the, the worst bus is uh, one of the buses that has all the kindergarten kids on it because they haven't actually had a couple of years with the older kids. Usually when they go on the bus, they used to go with Tacoma Park and Piney Branch kids, so the older kids were safety monitors, but they don't even have that anymore. And so one of the staff members described it as a kind of Lord of the Flies situation on the, on the bus for the hour between uh, that it takes them to get between Tacoma Park and... Uh, 
and the school, and it's actually worse on the way home from school. You would think maybe, I guess the kids are all sleepy when they go out, but on the way back, they've just had a snack before they get on the bus, and they're kind of energized. They're crawling underneath the seats. Piper, my daughter, describes it as a party under the seats every day, going up and down the aisleways, and um, I think it's been really frustrating to the drivers. The drivers reportedly have pulled over on the beltway, um, which is an incredibly dangerous place to pull over because then they have to get back into the traffic, and it's really problematic. And um, the school district says, well, you know, they'll do some training with the kids and talk to the bus driver some, but they don't actually plan on putting any supervision onto the buses, which I think ultimately is what's needed. Um, so I sent a note to the other council members asking that we ask the MCPS particularly the, the superintendent of transportation and maybe somebody representative from the administrative staff to come back and talk to us again. I feel like there are a lot of constituents, not only in my district, but across Tacoma Park that are really interested in this issue. Um, you know, I point out that the school district wouldn't send kids on a field trip with this level of supervision on a bus. They would insist that you had to have two adults on the bus to help with the supervision, but they let it happen every day back and forth between Bethesda. Um, I think it's just a matter of time before somebody gets hurt, and um, unfortunately, you know, I'd hate to have somebody get seriously hurt with the kids barreling down the, the beltway while they're crawling around underneath the seats and, and walking across the aisleways. So I'll ask again that uh, we, as a group, try to engage the, the public schools and particularly the transportation folks on that issue. Other comments? Councilor Member <coughs> I want to um, say a good word about WSSC. Ooh. I know that sometimes we are fairly critical. Uh, if the clerk could put a special little designation <laughs> on the <board. laughs> They are, um, they've announced that they're going to paint, finish the paving of the 700 block of Erie Avenue on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. I want to alert those people who live on Erie Avenue to not leave your car there so that, in fact, they can um, finish the paving. Um, I'll just uh, comment that the observation of WSSC that they were done with the paving when, <clears throat> when Daryl had to point out that the city, as a rule, didn't put speed bumps only halfway across the street, that we generally had them go all the way across the street. And that was kind of a sign that maybe they weren't done yet. But Anyway, so that's, that's good. They're actually going to finish the paving. Second thing I want to remind people is that the census is coming next year, and it's really important for Tacoma Park to get a complete count. This is a big issue. Tacoma Park is one of the places that has, um, on the last count, had a large undercount. We need to do better. And I will point out to um, people who are watching <coughs> that if you return the form, no census worker will visit. So that's an <clears throat> incentive to, when you receive the form at the end of March next year, fill it out and send it in. <clears throat> no census worker will come. Third thing <clears throat> I want to announce is that um, uh, the uh, Council of Governments is having an uh, obesity forum this Friday from 9.30 to noon at the COG headquarters. Um, they're especially interested in <clears throat> what can be done about obesity through the schools. A very interesting presentation, and I'll report back to the council after it. That's it. Thank you. Councilman Robinson. Um, I want to talk briefly about dogs again um, <laughs> and uh, express my gratitude really to um, our city manager for putting up with my continuing um, stream of information and complaints about dogs and where they can run and where they can't run um, on their leashes and off. Um, it's been an interesting journey. Um, Council Member Wright and I have both uh, been active in uh, talking with folks both at Ed Wilhelm Field, which is a few uh, feet from here, and also Spring Park. There's also a Forest Park, uh, which has a group of dog owners who are interested in, in letting their dogs run off leash. It's drawn us into a conversation about uh, liability, which is very important, and also about um, where we, where our laws intersect and, inter, uh, and uh, intersect with county laws, and uh, I'm not going to give. There's no definitive answer to any of this at this point, 
liability is, is an issue, but there are plenty of places who have off-leash parks in this world and this country and the state. Um, and uh, the intersection of our city laws and county laws is of particular interest because it goes beyond just issues about dogs into all kinds of other issues. And the, um, uh, the city clerk was kind enough to forward to us a, uh, today a, uh, a spreadsheet showing all the municipalities in in Montgomery County, or was it the whole state? I think it was just Mont Montgomery County, right. Um, and which, where our laws are, um, uh, where, where we have no say in, in, in how we write our laws. In other words, we can't write a more, a less restrictive law than the county already has, as opposed to our being able to write a more, uh, I think I have it backwards, in, where we can't, we're not allowed to write a less restrictive law in many areas. Uh, in other areas, we must uh, adhere to the count to the county's laws and can. And uh, uh, anyway, this is the scenario that we're t we're starting to talk about, and I'm looking forward to continuing that conversation to see how we um, how our laws interact with and intersect with the county's laws. So rather than uh, rambling on anymore, I'll just leave it at that. Councilmember Wright. Right. I uh, want to make some comments about some car break-ins that have happened in North Tacoma and assure people that the chief is aware of the situation um, and they're continuing to uh, diligently patrol both with plain clothes and their tactical enforcement units at the appropriate times and they're using um, the statistics that they've gained uh, about the, the break-ins um, now and in the past to, to, to patrol appropriately and uh, they're watching the situation very closely and um, doing their best to resolve it and continue to make sure that uh, residents in the city are safe. Second thing I want to bring up is there's an opportunity to do a um, bulk purchase through the corn stove cooperative here in Tacoma Park. Um, if you're interested in that, you can go to www.saveoursky.com or contact Sachivan at 301-891-8891. So it's an opportunity to to purchase a, a corn stove in bulk so you'll get um, a reduction on the price of the corn stove and the installation as well as you're now eligible for a $1,500, up to $1,500 federal tax credit for that. And then you can become part of the, the corn uh, stove cooperative here which uh, gives you access to, to the, um, the corn stove, the, the corn pellet hopper that we have at the Public Works facility. So I'd encourage people who are, if they're interested in that or have been thinking about doing it, this could be a good push to, to take that on. Uh, second, just wanted to make sure that people are aware that in this election there's two different ways you can vote that are a little bit different than in the past. So one is that there's absentee ballots, um, but in, this year it's changed a little bit in that you don't have to have any reason for requesting an absentee ballot. So you can go to the city website and um, look that information up, or you could contact the city clerk at 301-891-7267 if you're interested in getting an absentee ballot. And then the second way is that there will be early voting. Um, I know the clerk is working with our uh, Board of Elections to determine the specifics of that, but there will be early voting, um, and people will be able to come in and vote, cast their vote early if they'd like. Just wanted to make sure people are aware about, of those two changes. Um, next, I'm very supportive of what Councilmember Robinson mentioned about the dog park issue and uh, trying to get that onto the agenda. I know Bruce is um, looking at options for how we talk about that. Um, and to me, you know what, I, I was confused when Councilmember Robinson was talking about the, the different issues. And there's a lot of bureaucracy in this in this situation. Um, you know, I don't always think bureaucracy is a bad thing, but I think in this case it's kind of a bureaucratic mess. And if you're a constituent, you just want to good, safe, open place for your dog to run. That's what the constituent wants. That's what our residents want. And so I think it's really on us to sort of figure out the bureaucracy so that there's a way for that to happen in a few places in Tacoma Park um, and not get caught up in, I mean, we have to deal with all the details, but we don't, you know, we, we just need to solve a problem for people, basically. Right. So those are my comments. Anybody else? I'll just mention that uh, as I've talked to people around the city, I've talked to some people who were interested in uh, <clears throat> the environmental task force, and I've pointed out to them that we've made the appointments and that task force is about to begin meeting, uh, but they're interested in 
what that group might be doing, so I've encouraged them to come anyway. So I just wanted to remind folks that uh, all of our committees are, uh, all the meetings are open to the public. You don't have to be a committee member to go to the, to the committee meeting. Uh, so anybody who is interested in the task force on the environment or any of the other city committees, you're always welcome to uh, look on the rolling agenda, find out when that meeting is, and attend. And people will be glad that you showed up and want to participate. Go ahead. Um, just that I'm supportive of uh, Councilmember Clay, uh, in, in that we should, I think we should have um, the school system come and explain what's going on on the buses. Um, mm -hmm. I have a lot of residents who are facing similar frustration. I purposely, my child was not at the school, and I purposely didn't send my child to school because I didn't think it was going to be a good situation for her to ride on the bus for 45 minutes each way. Um, I had the option to do that. Many people do not have that option. Um, I'll look into that with city manager tomorrow. Anything else? Okay. Um, next item is additional agenda items. There are none, and agenda scheduling update. I just want to point out a few quick things. Uh, <clears throat> next Monday, October 19th, our work session items include the uh, Ethics Commission update and report and two tentative items, the Commission on Idle and Tenant Affairs proposed code amendments and a discussion of the zoning text amendment uh, for CR zones. And the following week, assuming that uh, we do that, we will have a uh, resolution commenting on the CR zones to uh, send along to the County Council as they deliberate those. And our work session items on that Monday, the 26th, include a uh, presentation on the sidewalk study and a discussion of the resident survey. <coughs> and that's all I've got on those. So the next item on our agenda is adoption of the minutes for July 6th, 13th, and 20th. Would somebody like to move those? Moved Second. Moved by Councilmember Siemens. Second by Councilmember Snipper. Any discussion on the minutes? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> minutes are adopted. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the public comment period for anybody who would like to speak if you can uh, come to the microphone identify yourself and please keep your comments to three minutes seeing none we'll move on to the city manager's comments just a few items very nice of him. Um, this is a follow-up to last week's discussion on the lobby design. Like many others, our architect basically came down with the flu shortly after the council yeah. meeting. Um, so they've been a little <coughs> delayed. Um, they just sent us an email today just confirming you know, what they thought they heard from the council and will be working diligently to make some modifications and bring that back before you in the near future. Um, the last item I just wanted to share had to do with the um, public works facility. Um, previously, the council had indicated um, an interest in geothermal um, heat and at the um, public works site. I did want to let you know that the project architect has obtained some bids to do a test well. Um, Daryl notified me of that earlier today. Um, so they will be proceeding with um, one test well, which assuming all looks good, they could actually be put into service eventually. Um, so we'll keep you posted once we get the results of that testing back. Any questions for the city manager? Thank you. And we'll move on to the first item in our regular agenda, which is the uh, second reading of the ordinance authorizing FY10 budget amendment number one, which was tabled from last week. And let me see. Do we need to, uh, since I believe it was only tabled, I don't remember whether it was introduced, do we need 
depending on that answer, should we just reintroduce it? I think you should make a motion. I mean, it was introduced at first reading, but I think someone should move it. Move it at second reading. Second. Okay. Move. Moved by Councilmember Snipper, seconded by Councilmember Clay. So it's back on the table. And if the city manager would like to <clears throat> run us through it again, maybe in a slightly different format, and uh, <laughs> see if anybody has any questions this time. I know there's been some uh, confusion on some mem by some members of the public, and uh, hopefully a slightly different way of coming at it will uh, help in understanding a uh, fairly complicated budget amendment. I'll give the old college try. Um, I'll try to get through this. Track projects that are paid for with um, grant or otherwise restricted monies. Um, the proposed budget amendment would increase special revenue fund revenues uh, by just under $275,000. Um, this is essentially projects that we had thought would be complete as of June 30th of 2009. So what this budget amendment would do was essentially reappropriate those funds because um, the grant funds actually will not come in until this fiscal year. Um, special revenue fund expenditures would increase by um, 300, <clears throat> roughly 375,000. It's the same projects that I just mentioned that are affecting fund revenues, um, but this is also inclusive of the additional appropriation of the cable equipment grant monies. Um, as the council may recall from your meeting in July, um, there will be monies taken out of that restricted fund related to the auditorium renovation. And we had originally put $200,000 in the budget. The estimated cost of that equipment is actually 300000 And can you just say something real quick about the, uh, the ability to use those funds for something other than uh, cable equipment? They cannot be used for anything but cable equipment or something related to that. And they come from the, uh, from from the fees that are charged by the cable company? That's correct. Um, <coughs> Moving on to the community center fund, um, as the council is aware, um, what was budgeted in FY 2010 was strictly related to the auditorium renovation. That project, as a reminder, is being paid for through a combination of federal and state grant monies and a contribution from Washington Adventist Hospital. There were a few residual issues related to phases one and two that have taken place this year. We did incur some legal fees associated with that work by Bob Cox. He's our, been our specialized counsel on construction. Um, Mr. Cox's um, expenses for phases one and two are not eligible to be paid for out of the monies given to us for the auditorium. So the budget amendment um, would transfer um, $7,500 from the general fund to the community center fund to cover those expenditures. Is that and, and just to reiterate, I think the uh, the his legal funds are for phases one and two, and they can't be paid for out of the auditorium funds, which are essentially phase three. That's correct. There is some work that Mr. Cox um, performed related to reviewing the contract for the auditorium. That's an eligible expenditure um, for those federal, state, or funds, um, but just not any work that he may have done related to phases one and two. That's correct. Um, move on to the general fund. and. Hope I don't lose anyone here. Um, so council is aware uh, we will see a reduction in state revenues to the tune of about $577,000. Um, that represents a 90% reduction in our highway user revenues and a fairly sizable reduction in our state police aid. Um, Offsetting that revenue loss somewhat is two things. One is uh, Safe Tacoma Incorporated um, did return some money to the city. They had not um, expended all the funds that were given to them. Um, and then additionally, we had anticipated getting some funding from WSSC last fiscal year. Um, we typically enter into some cost sharing arrangements with WSSC for uh, road work yet to be performed. Um, that funding will actually come in this fiscal year. Um, and I would just note that the monies from WSSC are restricted. They are set aside in a restricted fund and basically used for future road projects. 
So kind of the net combination of the revenues we got that we didn't expect to receive and the loss from the state represents a general fund revenue loss of about $373,000. Um, on the expenditure side, um, this budget amendment would decrease general fund expenditures by about $417,000. Uh, the vast majority of that uh, represents savings that the city will see in its fringe benefit accounts because we had anticipated an 11% increase um, in our medical insurance. As the council is aware, we changed carriers effective July 1st for both our medical and dental insurance. Um, so we will save roughly about $264,000. Um, part of that is from essentially changing carriers. Um, there were also some staff vacancies where we might have expected um, someone to elect family coverage, and they elected single coverage, which is obviously less costly. So it's sort of a combination of both changing carriers as well as some um, changes related to staff turnover. Uh, the other portion of um, the reason why general fund expenditures would go down is um, the reallocation of certain expenditures in the general fund to the speed camera fund. Uh, there are certain functions related to the speed camera program that can only be performed by a sworn officer, um, and Chief Picucci can address that if the council has more questions about that. Uh, but we do have an officer who has been spending 100% of his time on the speed camera program since its inception. Um, from my standpoint, since that is what he is spending his time on, it would be appropriate to charge uh, that employee salary and benefits to the speed camera program. Um, additionally, the chief has proposed that we create a traffic officer position to put a little bit more focus in terms of our traffic details. Uh, certainly other officers would still continue to perform traffic functions, but the chief has proposed that um, that officer's salary and benefits be transferred to the speed camera fund as well. Any questions about So far so good? Um, on the speed camera fund side, obviously, as we just talked about, there would be certain expenditures that would be transferred to the speed camera fund. Um, the other change that would be impacting that fund um, has to do with the number of paid citations we are seeing. Um, at the time the budget for the speed camera fund was adopted, we literally had almost no experience um, in terms of seeing what the number of citations would be. Um, that has actually ended up being less than what we had originally anticipated, which is kind of a good thing uh, that people are slowing down. Um, the other factor is that the state legislature enacted legislation earlier this year that will actually change the number of miles per hour um, that constitutes a speed camera violation. Um, so our vendor has indicated that because of that increase um, in the number of miles that someone has to be going over to generate a speed camera citation, that we'll probably see about a 25% decrease in the number of citations being issued through the program. And that was the one mile an hour difference between what we were doing? The two. 10 to 12. Two. 10 to 12. Um, the arrangement with the vendor ACS, uh, State and Local Solutions, they get a essentially a certain cut of each paid citation, so it has the number of citations go down so will the fee that we pay them. Um, so in the budget amendment, the council may note that there is also a reduction in the contractual line item in the speed camera fund. That represents um, a reduction in the payment that will be made to ACS uh, because of the lower number of citations. And I know it's hard to kind of lump all of these funds together and give an overall number just because of the various restrictions. Right. Uh, but it, but in terms of the general fund, uh, the kind of where this leaves us as a result of the uh, state cuts and everything else that's involved here, if you can just give us kind of the bottom line on that fund. Uh, sure. Um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the loss that we will see because of the state budget reductions is a loss of uh, revenue of $577,000 roughly. Um, Safe Tacoma returned about 25000 to us, so if you take the additional revenue that we got from Safe Tacoma, which is unrestricted, and the, the proposed um, reductions in general fund expenditures, that leaves about $136,000 of the revenue shortfall that remains yet to be addressed in some way. Um, as I mentioned on the um, agenda cover sheet, uh, we have had some positions that have you know, been vacant for some period of time this fiscal year. That will certainly... Um, offset some of that loss. Uh, but we do have some um, 
other options that we'll be bringing forward to the council for your consideration at a future date. Thank you. Council, have any questions? Councilor Rice. I'll just say that um, in my household, the, the uh, speed camera revenue is going to go down 100% because my daughter's moved out to the West Coast. <laughs> And uh, we had two tickets this past summer. They were both 11 miles over the speed limit. And, um, <clears throat> we'll probably have one less speeder in town. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> maybe, That's I, maybe I should talk to my uh, son who, whose picture was taken in D.C. So <laughs> at least if he's going to have a speeding ticket, it should be in Tacoma Park. Yeah. <laughs> they make up the difference there. That'd be good. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would just like to say that this uh, ordinance is, uh, this amendment <clears throat> has brought to me, I think, more uh, constituent feedback than anything I remember recently. Mm -hmm. um, and the uh, kind of feedback I get isn't on any specific thing in the ordinance itself, but it's a, uh, a general pushback that I think that uh, all of us uh, should certainly be paying attention to, and that is a, a real outcry for uh, tax relief that uh, people are feeling true. Uh, very difficult economic times now, and uh, whereas they were willing to pay for uh, extra things in Tacoma Park when times were good, uh, they also are looking to us to find ways to help them uh, make it through the difficult economic times by uh, getting taxes and our expenditures under better control and to uh, lower the taxes to the extent that we can. And uh, for, <clears throat> I think, reasons that can be apparent, this uh, particular ordinance was a catalyst for people to, to get on the phone and start calling up about the taxes. Other comments? Councilor Robert Wright. I uh, just want to say thank you for the city manager for explaining all that in detail. Uh, you know, in some ways, maybe if we had separated this up into a bunch of amendments, it would have been easier for people to understand. But I think that explanation, if you, and if you read the document, it is clear what we're doing here. And so I appreciate that. And I think it's good that we tabled it for weeks so that the public has a plan uh, of response. Um, it does bring to mind something that, that Terry mentions is that people are just struggling with the taxes. And I think. Um, if we wait to start the budget process as long as, uh, not as long, but to in the normal time frame that we have in the past, we won't be able to have a discussion with the residents um, in the way I think we need to. Because I think this year where we've already been cut by the state and we've, we've done a good job uh, managing that situation, in large part due to the city managers um, with financial skills and understanding how to um, uh, squeeze blood from the stone. Um, but I think we're going to need to have a conversation earlier about um, what trade-offs we're willing to accept because um, we're not going to be like California where they basically say, okay, you can't tax anymore, but you have to provide these more services, right? We're, if we're going to reduce taxes, that means we're going to have to reduce services in some way. And we need to have a very frank conversation with um, residents about what those trade-offs and decisions are going to be. Um, so I hope that um, maybe after the election, um, or early on in the beginning of the next calendar year, we can figure out a way to structure some conversations with residents to have that conversation. And I'll just say that uh, also, thank goodness, it's not California, because if it were, then the state could come and say, oh, those property taxes that you levied on your residents at Tacoma Park, we'll take that, thank you very much, in order to fix our budget problems. Um, and I also just wanted to say that uh, last week I had a conversation with a uh, budget analyst at the Department of Legislative Services in Annapolis who painted an even more bleak picture than uh, we heard a couple of weeks ago from our lobbyists. So we'll see what the numbers are. I think very shortly they're due in just a matter of a couple of weeks. And uh, we'll see where we have to go from there, but I think we're all anticipating that uh, it's going to be tougher than we imagined. So the manager has some comments. I was just going to say, I think that would be very helpful if the council did have that discussion sooner rather than later. We were fortunate this fiscal year that we had some savings from our health insurance that, you know, were not known at the time we adopted the budget. Obviously, that's a one-time fix for this year um, that isn't going to be there next fiscal year. 
Um, on the 26th, the council is scheduled to talk um, and have the opportunity to review the draft resident survey. One of the things um, that we are talking to the survey company about and hope to be able to present on the 26th is perhaps a question that you could include in the resident survey to at least start um, getting some feedback from the community. I don't think that's the only way to do that. Certainly, I think there need to be some actual discussions um, with various parts of the city. Um, but I do think that might be a way to get some input in terms of where residents might be willing to see services reduced as a cost-saving measure. Thank you. Um, any other council comments on this second reading ordinance? Is there any public comment? Hi, my name is uh, Naveed Nassar. I'm a resident of Ward 6. I have a question, not a comment. I'm not sure if I should address it to the city manager or the chief of police. The, um, uh, the amount that's listed here, speed camera fund revenues decreasing by 797500 and the expenditures increasing by 55233 that's all due to that uh, two mile per hour, increased two mile per hour buffer. Is, is that the cause of all that? Yeah. Um, on the speed camera fund revenues, um, the reduction of $800,000 is strictly, it's due to two things. One is the change in state law, and two is our actual experience um, year to date in terms of the number of paid citations we were seeing. Um, we had anticipated, um, based on the warning period, that we would see about 7,500 paid citations per month. And I, I apologize, I think it's roughly about 6,600 is what it has averaged for the few months that we've actually been in the program. So what it is, people are actually speeding less. That's part of the reason for the revenue. We haven't really got a figure on what is, is the fact that tickets are issued, but they're not being paid. And there's a process for that, and we're, we, we really only have four months of statistics to deal with. <coughs> and in those four months, it, has dropped, it really hasn't dropped a lot, but the problem is only so many tickets get paid each month. We based our original revenue projections, correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Matthews, on the fact that we issued so many tickets and the tickets would be paid, but there's a large amount that aren't paid that we have to go through a process to collect. Does that answer it? Yep. Okay. Thank you. And, but it sounds like even with that lower number, uh, we, we still think that we're getting about two, an average of 200 per day, if it's 6,600. Actually, it's probably more than 300. It's about well, 350 a day. Well, the other thing I would say is when you see the paid citations, sometimes it's not just what happens in any particular month. They, they will send second and third notices. Right. So some of what you're seeing in any particular month is people who didn't pay on time past the 30-day window. Um, so I don't know if that helps. In terms of your question about the expenditures, um, the payment to the vendor will go down by about $312,000 because um, they get essentially a share of whatever each paid citation. Um, so that that's a decrease actually in expenditures. Um, about $153,000 is related to the reallocation of certain police department employee salaries and benefit costs from the general fund to the speed camera fund. And then the chief um, had also requested that some funding be allocated for the e-citation program. Uh, you wanted to buy some new LIDAR, which is essentially laser radar equipment and some other things. Does that help? Okay. Just to circle back to my comment for a second. No, no matter what the numbers, it appears that there are still hundreds of citations per day from the speed cameras. So even though it's, there are fewer being issued and fewer people speeding, hundreds of people per day is still quite a few. That's true. I just had a follow-up follow question. That 25 percent is a very conservative estimate because that's what we're seeing now is not collecting, right? You presume over time that more speed should go down. You know, they, that revenue would come in over time, right? Um, so that's like a, that's a conservative. We're being smart here and being conservative. In our we, with the change in state law, we approached the vendor and said, what would you expect to see happen? Because obviously they, they see all the data in terms of whether it's um, 11 miles an hour or whatever it might be. They suggested that um, 
as of October 1st is when the change in state law went into effect, that we would probably see a 25% reduction just because of the change in the, the miles per hour enacted by the legislature. So that, that will be a true reduction. So we've only been at it for, for a certain period of time, and we – we're still looking for to see what, what you know. You need a whole, almost a whole year to get a good sense. Plus, we're seeing in the collections, we started out one month, we got so much, and then it went up. And it, it's it's a matter of people I have to get the second notice. They tend to pay, and that's starting to pick up. And I mean, it's 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 really too early. We I can't say that it's went down. I'm actually surprised at this numbers right now that they stay pretty steady in the amount of tickets for, that we are issuing. Uh, but in talking to our, uh, the other municipalities in the county, it takes almost a year to get a good feel for what's going on. Are we accomplishing what we're after? And now that we're changing the speed, that's going to extend it a little bit longer, if that, if that explains it. I mean, and until we get a full year at it, we really won't have an understanding of everything and just with how it works. Okay. Thanks. We'll go back to public comment. Yeah, I, I had a follow-up question about that. Was uh, was there an estimate of of what the uh, payment rate would the, the final successful payment rate would be when going in? Not really, because it depends on each jurisdiction. Um, it it varies, uh, and that's why we can't. We need to get a full year under our belts to see how it's going to be, because the payment is varying. It started off slow, and now it's picking up, and we're getting more. But it, it, I mean, it, it sounds as if the the uh, plant the uh, presumption was that it'd be 100 percent, and it isn't. Or am I wrong? That no, it was never 100 percent. It was never 100 percent. No. no. Yeah, so, and so, what was it? But just it, you knew it wouldn't be 100, but you didn't know what exactly it would be. Well, we we talked to our vendor, we talked to the county, and it, it was really the best guesstimate that you could make at the time. Based on, we based it on the warning tickets that were issued during the first month. So we try to make a projection based on that. Would anybody else like to comment on this resolution? <coughs> My name is Roger Schlegel. I'm a Ward 3 resident. And uh, I just wanted to get clarity on something, which is I had the impression that the Speed Camera Fund, one of its major purposes was to allow for sidewalk construction, is that correct? It, it can be used um, for a variety of purposes. In the current fiscal year budget, we had set aside uh, $500,000 for um, sidewalk design and construction. So that's an individual choice by jurisdiction. Okay, so it would seem, it would seem that if um, some of that fund is now being allocated for police officer work, it sounds as if two positions are going to pay for out of the speed camera fund. So does this, in essence, represent a cut in the budget for sidewalk construction? No. Um, I noticed that, unfortunately, I didn't see that it got put in this week's packet, but I'd be happy to send it to you. Um, we had, as part of this budget amendment, provided the council at last reading um, with sort of a, an overview of the speed camera fund. Um, Based on what has been decided by the council at this point, there would still be um, a considerable amount of funding remaining at the end of this fiscal year, which the council at any time could choose to allocate towards um, sidewalks or any other purpose that is eligible underneath the speed camera law. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, guess, I guess I would just add that not having had experience with this particular technology and this fund, uh, we had a number of priorities that we felt it would address in terms of resident safety uh, and it would be pedestrian safety, neighborhood safety, so that some of the uh, neighborhood traffic studies and their implementation uh, are part of the money that we have. And the installation of sidewalks has always been a priority uh, for the city council, but the problem always was where are we going to come up with the money to do it unless we uh, have a special assessment on the homeowners, and that was our only choice for years, and therefore it didn't happen. So I think this has been a process of feeling out what the revenues are actually going to be, uh, what the what the legitimate expenses are for running the program, and the priorities for what we do with the money. And I think the city manager is correct that we, ha we haven't tried to divvy up the whole amount 
so that we could see what was happening and then add to it. Any other public comment on this resolution? <coughs> okay. Uh, then I think we can vote on this, and this is a second reading ordinance, so it needs to be a roll call vote. And would the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Williams? Aye. Councilmember Clay? Aye. Councilmember Robinson? Aye. Councilmember Siemens? Aye. Councilmember Snicker? Aye. Councilmember Victoria? Councilmember Wright? Aye. Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you. <coughs> and we will move to our next item, which is. <coughs> First reading ordinance appointing judges for the November 3rd city election. And would the clerk just like to say anything about this ordinance? Well, um, <laughs> the Board of Elections reviewed the applications received for election judges and has recommended the names uh, on, the, on the ordinance. At this point, uh, I haven't received confirmation from all of these uh, individuals that they can still serve, so there may be a few name changes for second reading. Additionally, the uh, Board of Elections will be meeting tomorrow night and reevaluating how many judges will be needed. So, again, a few additional judges may be requested. And if uh, election judges receive $135 for uh, the day for their service, a chief judge receives 175 and given the, um, the rate that the county pays these days, it's, uh, I think in two years we'll be requesting an increase in the amount <coughs> to um, pay the judges. Okay, would somebody like to move this one? Second. Move by Council Member Clay, second by Council Member Snipper. Council Member question or discussion? Seeing none, is there any public comment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the first reading ordinance appointing judges for the member thirds of the election, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. The next item is first reading ordinance amending the Tacoma Park Code, Chapter 13.12, Parking Meters. We had a work session discussion on this. Ms. Daines is back. Would you like to give us a quick run through on this one? Um. It's fairly straightforward as far as the uh, proposed ordinance. If you recall, we discussed in September the possibility of uh, amending the ordinance to allow for greater flexibility in terms of the placement of meters, the type of meters, um, fees, etc. cetera. Uh, Corporate Council has prepared a proposed amendment which is based on the code in the City of Baltimore, which provides a basic framework for the establishment of Parking meter zones expands the options that you might have as far as meters versus the, you know, when you go down to the district and you have a little box and it can cover a variety of different spaces um, and um, the placement of the meters, et cetera. What it also does is require that the city develop administrative regulations establishing the parameters under which um, new parking meters could be uh, installed or new parking meter zones be established but allows for the continuation of the existing parking meter zones until those administrative regulations are promulgated. And that usually takes from 60 to 90 days. So assuming that the ordinance is passes the first reading and the second reading, then we would start in the administrative regulations, and those would come back to you for consideration. And did the, our existing ordinance address uh, commercial vehicles parking in more than one spot, or is that something that we're adding? Um, it did, not in terms of uh, parking in more than one space. If you go to the very last page, the use of parking meter zones by commercial vehicles, it really hasn't changed at all except to um, expand or provide some consistency with languages included in the new definitions. Okay. That's where we're right. And those regulations would presumably have public communication process, and that's Correct. Yes, and establish a protocol for which um, a business association like the Old Tacoma Business Association um, could petition to have um, additional parking meters installed or parking meters removed or time periods extended or um, reduced, that type of thing. Councilmember Snipper. Um, I have a couple. Uh, questions about the concerns really about page on page six 
050. Um, in the new <coughs> section um, under maximum period, um, help me understand this a little bit. <coughs> I'm a, I have the following concern. I, under, under number one, it looks like um, I'll have the following problem. I park, I assume I'm going to be there for 20 minutes, so I put in 25 minutes worth of time or half an hour's worth of time. But then I realize partway through that no, I'm going to be there for the whole two hours. So I go out and I put coins in to bring it up to two hours. According to this, um, I'm not allowed to do that because it says um, secured by payment into the parking meter on a single occasion. I will talk to Linda about that. The intent is not to limit you to do that. So say, for example, it's a two-hour parking space, and you plunk in your money for 35 minutes, and all of a sudden you're going to be there an hour and a half. That's okay. The intent is that, particularly in the Old Town area, customer parking is for customers. It's not necessarily f On street parking is time so that it uh, facilitates the parking on the street of customers for the businesses, not necessarily um, the employees of that a particular establishment. There are other parking options for them. So it's this is intended so that you don't go out there and every two hours you plug it so by the time you get done at the end of the day you've actually been parking for 12 hours in a two hour meter. Hence that's what number three does. Right. But I will talk to Linda about modifying that language so it's more specific. And I would say number, number two also gets at what is being looked at at number three, but I agree that number one kind of is not consistent with that. Yeah. So a few right. words added there so that somebody only reading section one wouldn't make a mistake. Yeah, it's the phrase a single occasion. Yeah, I want to clarify what you mean there. Um, and then a kind of separate question on the multi space parking meters, those are where there's uh, one box, and you essentially go up and say, I'm in parking space three, and yeah, okay. Got it. That's it. Council Member Robinson. Um, uh, did you say where this the verbiage and the language came from? Uh, the city of Baltimore, I believe. Okay. It's based in large part on that. It's been modified so it addresses the city of Tacoma Park's uh, okay. circumstances. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to make a, an observation on in the very first 1312.020, uh, which is, I guess, page being at the top of page two. Uh, number B. It's taken me a while to parse this. It says there shall be at least one multi-space parking meter installed on each street block or other public area where multi-street parking meters are installed, which makes it sound like uh, I was having a little trouble with it. Uh, finally, I realized that there, if there's a large area where it's multi-space, this is saying there has to be one, at least one on each block. Correct. Um, so I, I'm seeing, I think I'm then seeing the, but it, the, the language uh, struck me at first. Uh, it's a little awkward. Yeah, I'm not, I don't want to nitpick on this. Um, and yet where it says on each street block or other public area, well, if it's on each street block, of course, there's going to be one. If there's one installed, there's going to be one. So that's. We'll work to clarify. Just that yeah, one. if you just clarify that one, that sentence of one a little bit. That's where we're right. Um, it seems to me we're uh, we're kind of giving uh, two powers to the city manager here, um, and I'm not sure about both of them. This originally came up because. Um, we're talking about changing the length of time on parking meters um, in uh, with parking meters that already existed. Um, and so um, that seemed to be sort of silly for that to come before the city council every time it made sense to change the parking meter from 30 minutes to an hour or two hours and you might do that based on construction or some other reason. Um, but we're, I didn't know that we were considering also, giving the establishment of, of particular areas of street um, that they would become zone parking spaces. Um, so I'm definitely okay with the first. I need to think about whether I'm okay with the second, because that seems like something that would come up less often. Um, it might be something that uh, the council might want to review and have a little bit more input and input from the public on. So I know the 
this is just the first reading of Correct. the ordinance. So um, I need to think about that a little bit more, but I just want to point that out. That could also be something that would be addressed in the addressed in the administrative regulations regarding the whole establishment and at what point the council becomes involved in that review process. Other questions or comments? Is there public comment on this first reading ordinance? Seeing none, all those in favor of first reading, please say aye. 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 I didn't write down the motion maker, and I, I may have missed it, but. I think it was Councilmember Clay, seconded by Councilmember Snipper. Okay, thank you. I just missed it. Do you, you're all set now? Yeah. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that passes unanimously at first reading. Yes? I remember moving. I, I moved the, uh, the budget amendment. Oh, then why don't you move this? I, I'd like to move this. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to second. Okay. Thank you. Now we'll vote again. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Now we're back there. <clears throat> I could have sworn we did that. Um, next item is a resolution endorsing the Program Year 36 Community Development Block Grant projects. And Ms. 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 Danes is back for multiple items this evening, which hopefully is a good thing. <laughs> then you don't have to uh, only be here for one and then come back another week, but we get them all together. Yeah. Councilmember Siemens. Thank you, Mayor. Um, because of my relationship with one or more of the applicants for the community uh, block grant, I would like to accuse myself in this discussion. Okay. Thank you. So noted. And remind me, we haven't introduced it yet. When do we get there? Uh, I'll move it now. So okay. <laughs> I'll second. <laughs> oh, moved by Councilmember Clay, seconded by Councilmember Wright. Okay, now we're all set. Good evening. Um, the council is being asked to consider a resolution endorsing uh, block grant projects for PY36 for the Community Development Block Grant Program. Um, Andy Kellerman, who's one of the members of the review committee, is here. And I don't see anyone else. So I've asked yeah, Andy there, to come up here. Yeah. <coughs> so I don't take the committee's name in vain when I give my presentation. Uh, Mr. Kellerman was one of five people that served on the review committee referenced in the ordinance. The other was Megan Gallagher, Annan Perrick, Perrick um, Sabrina Barron, and Howard Cohen. This is the second year that this particular group has reviewed block grant projects. They do a great job, and they um, and pay attention to the details. And can you just say very briefly uh, how, how you recruit people for that so that if people are interested, they know... Um, I send out notices every year in the newsletter and on the city's notice board and on the calendar, and then um, send out emails to individual, all of the council members asking if there's someone that they're within their ward that they know that would be interested in participating on it, and then mail, email former <coughs> committee members to see if they'd be willing to put up with me again for another year. Um, we try to keep things very tight, so we send out the information in advance. In the last two years, we've been able to do it with one or two meetings, I think. So it's it's a um, not meeting. an extended commitment. One, one or two meetings is nice. When I was on that committee, it met six or seven times. Yeah. I can't sit still that long, so <laughs> we try not to do that. Um, as noted in the memo, or memo there, we sent out a call for uh, projects and with a deadline of September 2nd. And we received four public service projects, and then two capital projects were um, uh, informally proposed by city staff. Uh, when the committee met to review the projects, they decided to base its review um, to focus on projects that met the human basic needs. Food and shelter were two of the examples that I included in the memorandum. And then unlike past years, to um, allocate all of the available resources for the public um, service project to a single entity, which fell within what their original uh, request was. Historically, they have um, 
sort of awarded a little less and was re requested by a number of subrecipients in an effort to fund more projects as opposed to one in its entirety. And this year they selected the Crossroads Farmers Markets Fresh Check Project um, in an amount of $25,000, not to exceed 15% of the allocation that we actually get when program year 36 um, comes around. Uh, this county was unable to tell us an exact figure at this point in time, so if you look at the ordinance or the resolution, it establishes a maximum there. If for some reason uh, the funding was significantly less and we had to go through and re re um, restructure projects and things like that, we would come back to the City Council and let you know about that. With the uh, Crossroads Farmers Markets Fresh Check Project, there's an estimated 1,415 families um, that would be benefiting from that on a weekly basis at the market. And the Fresh Check program extends over two uh, market seasons. The balance of the funds are set aside for capital projects. Unfortunately, you can't take your capital money and spend it on public projects because of the way the um, program is structured. We did not receive any specific capital projects from um, the community by the deadline, though I did receive just um, on Friday a letter from MHP requesting funding for uh, an energy retrofit project for one of their properties in Ward 5, I believe. Um, the, we um, pitched two general ideas to the committee as far as capital projects. One was continuation of the affordable housing programming, which is, if you recall, in past years is basically the capital money that could be used for specific affordable housing projects, none of which are defined at this, at this point in time, but would come before the City Council for specific action once the funding comes down, uh, becomes available to us. I'm not anticipating that happening. Uh, this would be the second year we've done it. I'm not anticipating that happening for another 12 months. So at that point, we would bring um, a specific project to you or to the committee for consideration. We also uh, proposed uh, the possibility of uh, using some of the capital funds for a commercial rehab facade program, which we're doing up in uh, New Hampshire Avenue on, um, in the Crossroads area. And the group expressed its preference for doing the affordable housing um, programs, and again, keeping with its theme that they wanted to focus on the basic human needs, food and shelter. Am I missing anything? Nope. You sure? That's about it. Okay. No, it was remarkably quick because there, there was really uh, no discussion. I mean, unanimous agreement in the, uh, with the people. You know, human needs, considering where we are today, we want to provide food and shelter, aid for food. Okay. Good. Thank you. Questions or comments from the council? Does the city manager have a comment? I just want to get clarification from Ms. Gaines. Um, on the resolution relative to the Crossroads Farmers Market, I think there may be a typographical error. It says $20,000, whereas the cover sheet says twenty-five. I just want to make sure. It should be twenty-five. Twenty-five. Thank you. Now, council questions or comments? Uh, council Member Wright and Council Member Clark. Is the twenty-five thousand? Small. And I'll probably, it's never been more than 25000 even at the top of the, the funding cycles that we've had. If it comes in higher than 25000 then we would come back to you and to the committee to evaluate how those funds could be allocated. And I know in the, the past, the farmers market has come and gotten funds directly from the city also to help with the running of the farmers market. And um, the idea would be to have a concern about long-term business model for the market, whether it can become sustainable. Um, are we confident that the market will be operating for the period of time in which they would give this to be able to provide this um, subsidy? Um, Michelle Dudley is here, if you'd like to um, speak with her directly. Um, Michelle is the manager of the Crossroads Farmers Market. Um, this is her second year that she's been doing it. And she's been doing a great job in terms of applying for and identifying alternative funding sources. 
the tricky part is that grad cycles don't necessarily correspond with the market. So many of the efforts that she's undertaken this market season actually won't have any financial benefit until next season. So if she continues to um, follow that approach, I am quite comfortable and confident that they will be operating. If for some reason, when these funds become available and the Crossroads Farmers Market doesn't exist or the Fresh Check program was dropped for one reason or another, again, we would come back and talk to the council and the committee about how those funds could be reprogrammed. And, and if I can just double check on the reprogramming, I know that uh, a couple of years ago uh, we were reprogramming and reprogramming uh, and we kind of cleaned that up so that we didn't have as much reprogramming. Is that still any concern? We don't like to reprogram. Um, it makes the county crazy. Yeah, that's a good word for it. Um, so, and I think historically, if I understand correctly, some of that was uh, with streetscape projects and things like yeah. that, a lot of the capital projects. Um, one of the things that uh, we've been working diligently towards, and, but it's still taken a while, is to get it so that when people apply for a grant, when they actually get their money is a lot closer to when they're actually applying for it. And so we've, the county's been really um, uh, helpful in terms of doubling up uh, program years. So right now we're doing two program years at one time. Um, and I think that as soon as we get caught up with that, if you will, there will be less of an issue of reprogramming because the, the project that needs the funding will get the funding within a reasonable time period rather than trying to second guess what they're going to need in two years. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they don't like reprogramming. I don't like reprogramming. It's Nobody does. Nobody does. Okay, thanks. Um, you had I just want to follow up to, to say thank you to Andrew for spending time on this and uh, volunteering and other ways in the community as well. Councilmember Clay? So I've always wondered why we were trying to answer these questions two years ahead when every other jurisdiction that I've worked with is, is making decisions based on the immediately following programming year. So that's going to be rectified now. That's been my personal goal for the last two or three years. I that's don't know great. why it is the way it is, but. I asked you about this when I first came on the council, and you said that it was the way Montgomery County interacted with HUD. But like I said, I've never I've never seen it in other places. So. Yeah, I, I, I'm not, that's what they keep telling me. <clears throat> um, but we're working our way up. Well, then you also faster. have this issue of you don't actually know how much money you're programming for, which is somewhat right. maddening. Um, but that's actually not what my question was. So that I was going to ask you. I wanted to ask you about the facade improvements. What was the what was the budget uh, that uh, HCD made for the New Hampshire Avenue facade improvements that was um, the the initial project that was approved uh, a couple of years ago was twenty five thousand dollars for facade improvements in New Hampshire Avenue. And the way the program is set up, it has to be in a very specific area because of the low and moderate income, which really limits where the money can be spent. So I think right now it's the bulk of it's on Holton Lane. And a majority of that funding has been um, drawn down. We have additional resources through the Community Legacy Program, so we're hoping to do that. Um, I think it was just $25,000 or something like that. When I talked to the review committee about it, we didn't talk any numbers at all. It was just kind of, okay, do you want to do affordable housing or would you like to do um, commercial rehab? Um, but the, eight, the, the CDBG money is also eligible based on who it serves, not just on who the people, who the makeup of the people are in the neighborhood. And I would, I would think that the businesses that run particularly close to uh, New Hampshire and 410 would would serve a, a low mod clientele. Correct. The way the, because, I think I have this right, the way the county has our particular s set up, it has to benefit Tacoma Park residents. So any of the program funds that we use have to be um, in a low and moderate income area that is within Tacoma Park or has to directly benefit low and moderate income residents of Tacoma Park. So 
while there may be a lot of low and moderate income constituents in Ethan Allen, for example, that may not necessarily be um, an eligible expenditure because I don't believe it's in a um, targeted area. So like with the cross fresh checks um, and the Crossroads Farmers Market project, um, Michelle's been working on uh, this year as part of all of our other grant applications is to track how many of the people that are there are from Tacoma Park and how many are um, Montgomery County residents or Prince George's County residents. And the only people that we will be able to reimburse them for are Tacoma Park residents that are low and moderate income. So that's, it's, it doesn't make sense, but that's kind of... And if we, if we administrated this ourselves, which I'm not sure is possible in the state of Maryland, but it's certainly possible under the HUD regulations, right? We could either, we can either operate as a subset of Montgomery County or um, become part of, have Montgomery County um, administer our funds. There are advantages and disadvantages to both. Which do, right now we have admi Montgomery County administer our funds, right? We administer our funds under their directions. So, so they, but we're they not tell a subset. We are part of, we are part of Montgomery County. Right. We so we're not, we're not the subset model where the, they administer our funds. They administer our funds. Right. But we direct them in how we want them Right. To and we could not do that and then apply to Montgomery County directly for block grant funds for specific projects, which could give you a greater flexibility in terms of dollar amounts. So say, for example, you had a project that was $200,000 right now and you needed the money in six months or whatever the cycle is. You could apply to Montgomery County if it was selected and eligible. You could have your money for that particular project in a more timely manner. Um, the council is elected not to do that. Um, so we can't be a completely freestanding entity, like when we were in the city of Oakland in California, no. we were our own freestanding entity. Okay. Right. And, and if we <coughs> chose the other model, is it conceivable that we could get nothing? You could get nothing or you could get a lot more, yeah. But there's nothing right now that stops a Tacoma Park entity from also applying to the county. Is that correct? Correct, unless their services are limited solely to Tacoma Park residents. Right, but there's relatively few right. of our entities that are limited just to Tacoma yeah. Park. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my last statement is just that I, I always want to spend the full 15% on the, on the non-construction project, so if by some miracle we we end up with more money than what we've allocated I would absolutely want to come back and reallocate that yeah. to some community applicant. Thank you. Somebody else have a question or a comment? My question was answered. Okay. Is there a public comment? If you do you have to go up there yeah. <coughs> Just a note on the, the Fresh Check program that we are securing other sources of, of funding and working towards sources of revenue as well. Um, we just this past week were a recipient of a Kaiser Permanente grant for 50000 for um, specifically the Fresh Check program. So we are planning to see it continue um, you know, throughout. It's, we're in the third year right now and we, would, we are planning to to con see it continue for as long as the Crossroads Farmers Market is in existence. It's hard to imagine that it would, the market would take place without the Fresh Check program. Um, and this year, on a weekly basis, we do see, during June and July, we did see more than 400 people in attendance at the Farmers Market. Um, and the Fresh Check program was a 300% increase. Um, due to limited funding, we've had to decrease that, and so those numbers haven't continued to rise at this, at this time. But, um, yeah, we, we would appreciate any, any funding and uh, do, do believe that the, the program is, is growing and will continue to grow with your support. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? <clears throat> okay. All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And Councilmember Siemens recused.
Okay, the next item is a resolution providing appointments to the Small Community Grant Review Committee. We have a salmon sheet, additional appointments from the blue sheet that was in the packet. Uh, there are seven slots. There are five names on the list. And does the clerk want to make any comments? Oh, um, I mean, just for those who aren't familiar with this, um, earlier this year the council established a small community grant program um, to basically award grants of $2,500 or less to community groups that are um, conducting activities that will further the goals um, as set forth in the council's strategic plan. Um, the structure would be that um, each member of the city council would have the option of appointing someone to that review committee. And as the mayor indicated, um, as of late this afternoon, the staff had received five names um, from members of the council. So there are still two slots available. Councilman um, Brown, I did call in a, a sixth one, um, Jacqueline Schick. And um, it was late. So if I could have that. Um, name added to the list, I'd appreciate it. Okay, so <clears throat> since we haven't moved it yet, Rafe, right, would you like to move it with that change? I would. <coughs> I'll move it with that so change. Would you like to second it? Second. Moved by Councilman Ramos is second by Councilman Ramos with six names. Any further comments from the council? Any public comment? Okay, then uh, all those in favor of, oops, sorry, go ahead. It's okay. It happens all the time. Um, Naveed Nasser, Ward 6, um, could you just, in the handouts we were given, you said you have five names and uh, uh, Councilmember Robinson said he added a sixth uh, shortly before the session began. Um, what are the, the remaining three names that aren't listed in the, in the handout we were given? Is it possible? For, uh, uh, is it okay for us to know that? Right now? Oh, okay. Sure. It's uh, Sarah Sliggers, Sherry Daniels, and Jacqueline Schick. Uh, yes, but I just put as the Jacqueline Schick be put on. The, it's Ben Frey in my world of Ward 3. Ben Frey and Jacqueline McEachin. I didn't follow the, the, that. Okay. Uh, I, there were three three members of my ward who had applied for this. I, I uh, have suggested that one be appointed. The two that uh, I didn't suggest to be appointed are Jacqueline McEachin and Ben Prey. So that's two of, two of the additional members. And uh, Mayor Williams, you mentioned one other whose name I don't recall. So what we have, I, I believe what we have is... Uh, two appointments from Ward 1, two from Ward 2, one from Ward 3, and one from Ward 4, and we have one additional appointment left, and that is Council Member Snippers. So just want to be sure, Sarah Slayers, is that her last name? Yes. Okay, and then Jacqueline McEachin? I, I recommended Jacqueline Schick. Schick, okay. And what was the third one? Sherry Daniels. Sherry Daniels, okay. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jesse. This, if you get the salmon color sheet, this should be. They may all be gone, but. No, I, I see some. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Thank you for um, apologize for wasting your time. That's all right. <laughs> um, this is a good chance to point out to folks that anytime there's a salmon sheet back there, it's always an update on a blue sheet. Any other public comment? Okay. All those in favor of this resolution, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Carried unanimously. And we will take a short break and come back for our last item of the agenda, which will be the uh, police, proposed Police Chief's Advisory Council alternative to the Public Safety Citizens Advisory Committee.
speak about our proposal. But uh, first, I'd like to briefly discuss the proposal I've brought forth. The concept of a police chief's advisory board has worked successfully for me in Louisville, Kentucky and Front Royal, Virginia. It's another tool in the community policing basket to be used. It opens up citizen communication and participation in our police department. It brings openness, transparency to police operations. It allows me as chief to reach out to all six wards, the business community, the religious community, and the schools. The board builds a strong partnership with the community, which is the heart of community policing. It has always been to me a barometer of how we are reaching the community and doing our jobs. Each month, me as the chief would open myself up to questions, comments, and complaints. I've always found it enlightening and candid. As the chief, I and the department benefit from this type of dialogue. Citizens who participate feel empowered and a vital part of the law enforcement process in their community. The board elects a chairperson who works with me in setting the agenda. This person runs the meeting and has input in each monthly meeting. We also invite members to departmental events. I find they do attend for our department events. It sends a positive message to the officers. I could go on, but I'd like you to hear from someone who's participated and been a part of this process, Mrs. Hart. I met Ms. Hart in my first year in Front Royal. At that time, she managed the largest shopping center in Front Royal. She attended our Citizen Police Academy in Front Royal, and after graduation, I asked her to be a part of the Citizens Advisory Board. While she was serving on the board, I asked her to volunteer and take on the formation of our Volunteers in Policing program, which we started, and she had it. Shortly after I retired, she ran a very successful program, which I anticipated in selecting her, and which led to her being appointed two years ago as a part-time community relations specialist for the department. I might add in the two years since she's been that, she's now a certified crime prevention specialist in the state of Virginia and works for obviously the Front Royal Police Department. I think Ms. Hart's more qualified to discuss this proposal from a citizen standpoint, which continues under the second police chief since I've left. We'll both take questions after Mrs. Hart speaks. Vance? Thank you all very much. Uh, chief Ricucci invited me, like he said, we should have compared speeches first, <laughs> statements. Chief Ricucci invited me to join his uh, advisory board, like he said, in 2001 after I had graduated from Citizens Police Academy. I have remained on this board through three police chiefs now, currently serving as a secretary to the board, taking minutes of the meeting since I became an employee some years ago, and employees are not allowed to be board members. The Chief's Advisory Board has served as an open door to the community for the citizens we serve. Community policing brought to us by Chief Ricucci changed many ways that our department conducts business with its citizens. Before Chief Ricucci, our department had a closed-door policy and citizens rarely saw the chief. Since community policing began, Chief Ricucci and the two chiefs I have served since him have continued this open-door policy with the public we serve. While a concept of an average citizen, such as myself, having an audience with a police chief, much less one listening to suggestions that a citizen might have, seemed very foreign to me. Now, eight years later, I hardly remember what it was like before community policing and a chief's advisory board. Board meetings took place on a monthly basis. The chief would update the board on current events within the department, hiring new officers, the education of those officers, promotions within the department, those types of things. Board members were also invited to attend those promotion uh, ceremonies. Budget concerns were discussed, and it gave the citizens an educational viewpoint of how the department runs and helped them to understand that such government agencies do not have bottomless budgets that can that things can be must be balanced and controlled. While the economy eight years ago was not in the difficult situation that it is today, it still has a, was a very eye-opening uh, event for me to understand and grasp how law enforcement monies are spent and how they are accounted for. Chief Ricucci has always, was always available to board members for their input and concerns, whether in a board meeting or out of the office. Also, an important part of these meetings is the roundtable discussion period. 
where each board member is allowed time to bring to the table issues that he or she may have observed in the community, such as traffic issues, public safety issues, patterns that may or may not need to be changed, but at least consider looking at these issues. Zoning violations were also important in our small community. It was an opportunity to bring to the chief issues and or concerns that the average citizen may observe but never make that all-important phone call to the station for fear that it might fall on deaf ears or never be looked at at all. Chief Ricucci's first board was a very enthusiastic group and we did things together as his board that I think made him proud and helped the citizens to know that we were there to help and assist the department as a whole and the chief specifically. We were a team and still today the current board works together for the betterment of the community. We were available for festivals, parades, and even council meetings. When new ideas were being brought before our leaders, we were able to, to see and hear, they were able to see and hear from his backers. Being in the public's eye at festivals and parades was another way to open those doors and invite the citizens to approach any one of us, especially if they were afraid of a police officer or chief. We have even placed ads in local newspapers with all of the board members' names and phone numbers for the public to contact them, and they could readily carry those concerns to the chief. At the meetings, many times, we would have guest speakers for just 15 or 20 minutes. New members of the department were brought in, new officers, local government officials, just to name a few. Just before Chief Ricucci retired from Front Royal, he was able to introduce us all to the new town manager. The benefits of this was very positive. Um, also meeting the new officers, uh, for them meeting, new, meeting the citizens that they serve and the board members were meeting the new officers and having a chance to talk to them, congratulate them and have a face with a name when reviewing sectors. We go by sectors, I think you all go by wards, same thing. The board elected its own chairperson. Two year rotations are advised and this brings more and different viewpoints to the table. I am 100% convinced that a police chief's advisory boards work if you work them. One of the greatest things I can say about the three chiefs I have served is that all have been open door policy leaders and, look, and took the time to listen to their citizens and care about the issues that concern them. The PR value of these citizens that assist the department is priceless. I'm honored to be here and to make this presentation to you all this evening. And I would be more than happy to attend the first meeting of the first board to encourage the students to assist their police department in making a better community for all. It is community policing at its best. Thank you, Ms. Hart. Thank you. For taking the time to come and talk to us. My pleasure. Does the council have questions about the proposal? Council member Snipper, then Council member Lawrence. <coughs> okay. um, thank you very much for coming. Ms. Hart, that was, um, uh, no, knowing the chief, at least as, as well as I do, I'm not the least surprised that um, he set up a good advisory committee there and it worked well. And um, I think an advisory committee uh, for the chief is a great idea. Um, but I don't think that it should replace the um, Public Safety um, Citizens Advisory Committee um, for the following reasons. I think the, um, the PSAC, as I like to call it, um, <clears throat> has a broader mandate than just police functions. Um, they consider uh, or should consider anyway, um, issues uh, surrounding, say, sidewalks or um, youth activities and recreation or street lights or traffic lights, similar sorts of uh, other public safety kinds of things that um, wouldn't ordinarily come up in the sort of chief's advisory uh, group. The second thing is that um, I believe the city would be well served by having uh, as independent as possible, a group as independent as possible from the chief. 
and um, the chief is a very dynamic person, and um, I think it's helpful to have a completely separate uh, committee um, that essentially sees the chief occasionally, but not every month. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to also suggest uh, um, an addition, which would be that um, if the council is not interested in setting up a chief's advisory group, I think they, that it would be useful for the chief to have such a group. I think we could get much of what the proposal for the advisory group <coughs> um, contains if we had the chief appear at um, council meetings like this and had the public ask um, whatever questions they might have. So those are my, my three kinds of comments. And if I can just follow up on one of them. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there's nothing to prevent you from just going ahead and setting up your advisory committee. You don't need the council to bless it. You can just do it. Yeah. Right. So I think the, the yeah. information that, that we're hearing is to help us understand whether that would provide the functions that we think need to be addressed, whether we need to uh, continue with the Public Safety Citizens Advisory Committee so that we would know whether we had, you know, both or just one, and it might be helpful in understanding uh, any direction that we might give to the Public Safety Citizens Advisory Committee if that continues. Councilmember Robinson, you got a question? <coughs> um, yeah, it has to do. Thank, thank you for coming, for coming down. It has to do with what kind of reports we get from both the chief and the department, and also around issues um, from the public. And so I'm trying to anticipate or think through what we what we get. Um, it does say in our in our memo that uh, it is anticipated that the advisory board would periodically provide reports to the council and city manager. So, um, in your experience. How did you interact with the, the council in front row, or do you? On a, on a monthly basis, no, we do not. The chief carries whatever concerns are brought, and if they are um, issues that, and um, this gentleman, Mr. Snicker, mm -hmm. your issue about public safety issues, many times those are brought to the chief's advisory board meetings, and turns out we do need a stop sign in a certain place. Uh, we do need a sidewalk repair that maybe no one's noticed. And these things are brought to our town council meetings. So yes, they can be brought Okay. Can be brought before that. The way it would work if there was an issue uh, in the community that came up that needed council, I'd first take it to the manager and then set something up, just like this work session, or I'd make a report to the council. And usually if I made a report, be a member, the chairman would be there with me and she would it was a she when I left. She would get up and report also on what the committee had discussed. It was a joint thing, and as issues come up, we reported to them. And as Janice said, it wasn't just about crime. It, it got sidewalks, interstates, uh, anything that nobody else could figure out. They always brought it to the police department, which is basically the way it is today. So a lot of those issues were covered. And just a funny story to tell you how this actually does work in getting your public to pay attention to what we did. We uh, had a Christmas float one year, and we were riding down the street, and we turned a corner, and we had a citizen jump out and say, hey, we need a stop sign at the intersection of this place and this place. And I wrote it down on the float. Two months later, we had a stop sign. It was necessary. It was needed where she suggested. And I know that's a corny story, but it was the absolute truth. That's how it happened. Councilmember Stevens and the Councilmember Plain. Thank you, Mayor. And I uh, thank you, Chief Ricucci, for bringing this forward. I think it's a dynamite idea. I'm uh, really uh, glad for you to be here tonight and tell us some about how it worked uh, in the past or it's working now. But uh, I think it's super to, to uh, even closer, establish an even closer relationship between the community and the police officers in the department. Um, I think uh, I've been periodically frustrated through the years with the Public Safety Citizens Advisory Committee, and I think that uh, we have tried to do too many things within the committee 
uh, some of which weren't advice for uh, policy advice for the council, but got involved in uh, trying to do things such as you've outlined for a police chief's advisory committee. Um, I would also hope that uh, a uh, police chief's advisory committee could go a little step further than what you've described, and maybe it's part of what you do in Front Royal, and that is um, actually uh, implement some, some uh, projects that, uh, and one of them that comes to mind just because the Public Safety Advisory Committee was talking about it recently, was uh, helping to form uh, neighborhood patrols, uh, things like that, where the uh, residents from, an, from the area may present that to the committee, and I would much rather see uh, the police department helping to guide that in the formation of those neighborhood patrols and not only guide but monitor and uh, and uh, control how the, what the kind of work the neighborhood patrols do and I would again see that as being uh, a very appropriate uh, use of the police chief's advisory committee so I guess what I'm seeing is more than just advisory committee but also uh, a cadre of volunteers for uh, tasks that are uh, under your control and direction. I might add, and Janice can probably give you the numbers, but just about everybody on the advisory committee became volunteers and are volunteers in policing. And as you can see, I recruited the first cha chairperson right. to run it. And um, it was a partnership. They did a lot. They did a lot. When you get into the volunteer, they did a lot of what you're just describing. And, and so what I'm saying is then, uh, after hearing your comment is that I would like to see you not only do the police chief's advisory committee, but also the uh, volunteers in policing. Well, that is one of the goals time. that I have for staff this year. We haven't made the progress that I would like at this point, but we are still working on it. I hope to get it moving a little bit faster. I strongly encourage you on that in that vein. And I think what it does is it, uh, uh, it then takes a, a big chunk of what the police, uh, the Public Safety Advisory Committee has been trying to do through the years. And from my perspective, uh, things that have gotten in the way of what I thought that the Advisory Committee should be doing, the Council Advisory Committee should be doing, uh, I think that there's still a, a advantage to having, uh, to the Council having an advisory group. I'm not sure whether it should be a standing body as we've had through the years or whether um, it be a uh, task force similar to what we put together for an environmental action task uh, to come up with uh, uh, legislative advice to the council to uh, see what we could uh, consider in the next year or two. Um, I think there are a number of uh, policy questions that could be considered the, the advisory public safety advisory committee, not your advisory committee, but the council's advisory committee or task force could go out, look at those uh, things as directed by the council, and uh, come back with a report to the council with recommendations for uh, legislative changes that would be appropriate for, for the city. And certainly, you wouldn't be excluded from that. The police department would be involved in that, but. Uh, for information as those recommendations are being developed and then the council would work with the police department to see how the recommendations uh, could or should be implemented. So that's a long way of saying I really support uh, your proposal I, and I know you didn't even need my advice or my opinion but uh, my opinion is that uh, it's a great idea. I'm really glad that you brought it forward and I fully support it. And if I can just follow up for a second, then I believe it was Councilmember Clay was next. Um, <clears throat> on a point that Councilmember Siemens made, um, made me wonder if if you did your advisory committee and we had the Public Safety Citizens Advisory Committee, uh, do you foresee any difficulties in terms of your department basically staffing both committees? It would mean another meeting for me to attend because I do attend each public safety meeting each month when we've had them. That's what, you, that's what I'm here for. That's what it's about. I don't have a problem with that. 
Okay. I just but, but I, also, I, and I, I wanted to know that ahead of time rather than heading down the road and then somebody says, you know, we've really got a problem with staffing this. I would like to reiterate what I've said in the past, and that is I don't think that you or the, the police officers or representatives of your department should be at all of the uh, public safety advisory committee meetings. I think it was appropriate when you were, uh, when they were doing uh, tasks that were beyond just advising the council. I think that is there an advisory committee to the council, they should be able to come to you with questions or Are they can find me when they need me. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, we will do whatever. But I don't think it, I don't think it would be. I don't think it's appropriate for uh, you know them to be depending on staff if they're developing uh, policy recommendations for the council. Okay. Councilman Reply. Thanks for coming all the way to Tacoma Park. Um, Both of you. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he just lives far away from his job. Um, so I think one of the worst things that we can do as a council is commission uh, a, a committee or an advisory board and then not engage them, which I think is what we've done um, with this committee and maybe with some other committees as well. Um, and that's the reason why I think that uh, I'm, I'm willing at this time to let the Public Safety Citizens Advisory Committee uh, go. I haven't really found the reports uh, that, they, that they really feed into what I do in my work on the council. Um, and I feel like when we brought the topic up, we didn't get from the, the, the police department, which is our main council staff uh, partner on this, probably also maybe with housing and community development, um, new things about how to engage and identify work for the Public Safety Citizens Advisory Committee. We got actually an entirely different structure, which has been vetted in other areas that our, our police chief is familiar with that he would like to engage. And I, I think that's a message, to me anyway, and I hear that message. Um, and so I support you setting up the citizens advisory or the um, your police chief's advisory committee, and hope that eventually we get our own volunteers in in a policing group too, which I know we talked about last year, and you thought maybe it was eminent, but um, we'd love to see that happen as well. I think there are we, we've had some volunteers suggest interest in different groups. We have people who are continuing continue to have interest in um, public safety. Um, after I, I came back from my absence this last month, I put out a second call for people to sign up for the Small Grants Committee. I got about 12 people who have responded, and even though we just appointed one tonight, you know, I intend to go back to them and, and say, hey, we have these other openings on committees where we need work, and it's not all, you know, a committee that meets every week, and try to engage our volunteers, which is what we've said we wanted to do. And so I don't feel like right now the structure we have is a, is a meaningful way to do that. Um, since we've moved to a strategic plan model and we have set up, you know, kind of our first task force that we want to work on, I think the same thing might be in order uh, around the livability issues, which is where a lot of these public safety issues come up and would like to see us sort of reimagine how we would do that work because I just personally don't feel that this structure right now is particularly uh, meaningful to me anyway. Um, and I think that's our, that's our better way to engage our volunteers even around the safety issues. And, and sort of while I'm on this, this isn't specific to the safety uh, committee, but the other thing is when we have groups of people who are interested in engaging around the issues and we find that we're not really setting out tasks for them, or when we do set out tasks for them, they come back with a slew of things different than anything we ever asked for, which has happened with the Public Safety Citizens Advisory Committee. They have, kind of have their own mission. To me, that's like an independent group. It's like if we were talking about it in terms of an environmental issue, we might be saying, well, you know, the place to engage that kind of dynamic interest would be in the uh, Friends of Sligo Creek. I can't think off the top of my head of a comparable group. Well, yes, I could. You could engage with the CERT group. I don't know if the county has a citizen core group or not, but you might engage around that kind of a nonprofit group. There are probably other kinds of entities where you can engage in that. 
you could engage at your uh, local neighborhood association. A lot of the neighborhood associations really need people who are engaged and interested. So I think for, for me to have them redirected into this, this citizens advisory group that comes to the council that I don't really utilize, I would just rather redirect them to their to their neighborhood associations to engage in that level. And it was really interesting to listen to you talk about you know, the sidewalks and, and some of the areas where you, you engage. I don't think that actually goes through our Citizens Advisory Council. People come to direct to the council, and we already have a mechanism that's set up to do that where that gets vetted through our neighborhood associations, and that's, that's how it works in our city. So, um, so maybe as a complement to what you're talking about to your own advisory group would be to redirect these folks back through their neighborhood associations, strengthen our neighborhood associations, and this is really where this activity is happening. I know I feel really strongly that I don't want to continue to engage uh, volunteers as advisory groups to the council when we're not, we're not feeding them agendas and we're not really utilizing the information that they come up with. I think it's disrespectful. We're spinning their wheels. And I don't really see at this point that we're going to engage this group on any new issues either. Like, I don't see a big change coming around the horizon at this level. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I think I'm pretty close to where Terry and, and Ruben are. Um, and that I think that this is uh, a very valuable thing to do. And if you want to do it, because I think you've been very successful other places and you've been very successful here, if you want to do the Chief's Advisory Committee, I yeah, think we should do that. Um, I do think that there's still a role for a public safety committee that's defined more narrowly as specifically advisory to the council um, and still a way to get concerns raised outside of the chief advisory council because I do uh, share that concern about um, having a sort of independent body that's appointed by us. Um, so my, my sense would be that to have both of them, if you, unless you were really opposed to that, but it sounds like as long as it's not a staffing burden, um, and I agree with the approach of you would go to the meeting I'm just one. I'm not opposed to the committee. I've worked with the committee. I think what Colleen said is, I think they have looked, and the committee's here. I know they've looked for some guidance and direction where you wanted them to go. And so I know sometimes they didn't feel they got the feedback. And this goes from various people that have worked with the committee. That's the feedback for me. This is an idea that me and um, yeah. City Manager Matthews have discussed, and I just think the time is right just for what's going on in our community and I have no problem I mean I'm just all I'm not saying anything negative about the committee I'm here to show an alternative and I would like to have the uh, council's blessing because I'll need your help in helping me select members yeah. and, and to me it's sort of if you if you're interested in specifically taking action on making your community safer I think you should engage in the, with the chief's advisory committee if you're interested in giving the council advice on public safety policy then you should go to the public safety committee. That's kind of the two chunks as, as I see it. Um, and I think that the council does need to, I, I agree with you, the council does need to give the public safety committee a little bit more direction. Um, and I think uh, if we can get some additional members in there and um, uh, if the new chair is strong and has the potential to have the, and with the right guidance from the council, it can be helpful. So that's kind of my. Any other questions? Thank you both very much. Thank you. And uh, it's been very helpful to uh, get this information. I think the uh, council has more to go on to kind of figure out where we want to go with uh, whether we continue the Public Safety Citizens Advisory Committee in its current form, whether we adjust some of our interaction with the committee or whether we disband the committee. Uh, my sense from up here from this discussion is that there probably is a majority to keep the committee and to uh, engage with the committee and uh, refine the uh, ways in which the committee and the council can be can help each other and uh, the discussions that we could have. Um, is there anybody, anybody on the council who thinks that, that characterization is 
incorrect or would like to provide yeah. comments on that? I, I <coughs> agree with your characterization and uh, I also wanted, I know that uh, as the Chief said, many of the committee members are here and I think that they wanted to make a statement. I wondered if the Mayor would uh, extend the privilege and the courtesy to them to do that. Sure. I'll stay up here in case there's something okay. I need to respond Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Chuck Thomas, and I'm the outgoing chair of the Public Safety Committee. And um, when I first heard about this from Chief Ricucci a couple months ago, um, I, I liked a lot of, uh, of what I heard. Um, but I, I was ambivalent and had this, this struggle. And, um, you know, the, the more I thought about it, you know, realized that... Um, um, you know, part of uh, part of my struggle was, you know, because I like Chief Ricucci, and and if it had to be either this or the the Citizens Advisory Committee, um, and I were to just look at it just as a matter of principle, it struck me that it is important to have uh, an independent body advising the the council, whether or not it's the same body um, that that could do, you know, a lot of the things in here. Uh, on, on the sheet are, are things that that could happen even under the current structure, but certain things like the last sentence at the bottom that talks about making reports to the city council. Um, obviously, a report isn't the same thing as um, as a recommendation, as um, provided by the current statute. So, um, you know, so with um, hearing what you're talking about tonight, if if it does turn out to be that the safety committee would continue to exist. Um, also, you know, then, then I'm satisfied with that. Um, as I had explained before, for many years we hadn't served as uh, an effective advisory body um, that, that wasn't really, uh, under previous leadership, the direction of, of you know, trying to get regular, a regular stream of resolutions on, on hot topics to the, to the City Council. And in this past year, um, while that was my strong intention and the intentions of the remaining members of the committee, uh, time constraints really um, were what thwarted that. But under, um, you know, the member here is not even a member, a de facto member, um, because he hadn't been appointed for, you know, he applied months ago. Um, you know, he has agreed to take over as chair, and as someone who has served as a as a congressional uh, staff, uh, as a you know as, a, as a running a congressional office, um, I think that uh, uh, I think that we can trust that the committee can step up to the plate. Um, I I do agree that uh, more guidance would be helpful, more specific requests for things. Also, though, I want to say that um, I don't I, you know as I said last time I, I spoke before the council here that. We don't always need a ton of bricks to fall in our head. A lot of times there's controversial public safety issues, hot topics on the front page of the Gazette. And, um, you know, it, it should be clear that, um, you know, certain things are just obvious that we should take positions on and that, and that there needs to be um, some, some degree of independence insofar as that, um, you know, presumably there will be a lot of times where the, the – our recommendations are something that the police department is happy with. There may be other times, um, you know, just to pull an example out, um, you know, hypothetical, the taser, uh, you know, that, um, you know, a committee could presumably have, um, you know, recommended against purchasing the tasers or, or something like that. That would be the type of a more policy kind of uh, matter that we, that we would gather feedback on. And it just seems like, I mean, I don't have a position on tasers one way or another myself. I'm just saying that hypothetically our committee has never discuss that, but as an example of something, of the many things, tasers and license plate scanners and so forth, that are issues that, that had we taken on, um, that I think it would be important that it's um, clearly as a committee that reports to the council and not to the police chief, just because of the discomfort that people might have, you know, if, if the evidence points toward a particular recommendation um, that's contrary to what the police chief would want, that, that there's not that kind of struggle of, well, it's the chief's committee, should we show that deference, should we refrain from taking a position, that kind of thing. So it could very well be that the two committees really does solve that problem. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Uh, my name is Fred Schultz. I live in Ward 6 on Wildwood Drive. I've uh, served on the Public Safety Citizens Advisory Committee for I've really lost track, but it's probably close to five years. 
Um, and uh, when I first came there, I realized I was a layperson, didn't knew, know too much about public safety or the police department. And for the first couple of years, I just basically listened and observed. Uh, this was, uh, and before I go any further, a Andy uh, Kellerman here served, I think, close to 10 years as chairman of that. You talk about dedication because this is a difficult committee. Uh, and he stepped down about a year ago. Uh, so my, my uh, hat's off to Andy on that. But the, I want to say that having served on, on PSAC for this period of time, I think the chief's idea for a, an advisory committee is really an, uh, an excellent idea, and I strongly advocate it. I think that the, the, the Public Safety Committee uh, has not been able to and will not be able to do the kind of things that the chief has in mind, as has been described as happening in Front Royal. Uh, this committee will be able, this new committee will be able to provide much fairer representation, a much, uh, it will be able to attain a much more diverse and complete representation of all the stakeholders in the community. Uh, I think it will become a much more reliable and dependable venue for citizens, uh, where a forum where citizens know that they can uh, get their opinions heard, their fears, their anxieties. Uh, it will also, uh, I think, it will make the police chief much more accessible to, to the average citizen and much more visible. And it should help citizens to be get educated with regard to understanding how law enforcement actually works in the real world and how hard it is and complicated it is to do that job. And I know, if nothing else, that's one of the things that I've learned. And I've gotten to know Chief Ricucci uh, over the, the two and a half to three years that he's been in this position, and I think he's been doing an excellent job. Now, with regard to the survival of the, of the Public Safety Citizens Advisory Committee, uh, I'm not too ambivalent about it. I think that the uh, committee should be allowed to go its own way into history. I think we need to be careful is that, you know, we need to keep in mind that just because a committee's been created, it doesn't need to last in perpetuity. Sometimes they complete their work and their need is no longer there. But on the other hand, if it is decided, then I would say to you, if you're going to create or keep this committee here, then give it a mandate. In other words, it's one thing for the, the, the members of the city council to say, hey, this seems like a good idea. We, we should be able to have this committee to do policy work for, for the committee. Well, one of the problems <coughs> the committee had was that, I, in my opinion, is that we lacked any kind of direction or mandate from members of the city council. So if it's going to stay, give it a mandate, make sure that you select the people for that, not people who just drop out of the sky and say, oh, I'd like to serve on this committee. But make sure you pick the good people to serve on it who are going to show up and, and, and give them a charge <coughs> of what it is you want them to do. And I, then I think you can have a productive advisory body. But if you don't do that, then I would recommend that you just let it go, save the police chief the time uh, or his staff the time of attending those, those meetings. Uh, and that, that would be my suggestion at this point in time. I know that there's members of the committee here who have served alongside me who are interested in wanting to con see this committee continue. <clears throat> Frankly, I'm indifferent about that. I, I think if it's going to continue, that's fine. I'm not going to uh, propose that it does not. But I really do think that this, uh, the energy needs to be focused on what the police chief is proposing to do, and I think that could be a huge advantage to the neighborhood. And in doing the electioneering and campaigning that I've been doing, the issue of crime is always on people's minds. If you scratch the surface, ask them what's on their mind, it's, it's something that's there, and the people have lots of questions, and it's just natural as citizens of an urban area that that's going to be the case. And I think this advisory committee would go a long way to, to achieving what, what the chief was just talking about in terms of community policing and really giving meaning to that, uh, that frequent and regular and reliable interaction. Thank you.
I'm that Andy Kellerman who's, who was the chair for over 10 years or what have you. And I think the uh, chief's proposal to have a sort of a kitchen cabinet for the chief or whatever we want to call it, in one of my previous lives when we were talking about names, you know, call it a Schwinn bicycle, that doesn't matter. What it does is what you want to deal with. And uh, during my ten, uh, by the way, uh, Council Member Siemens and Clay have both touched on some of the issues. And uh, my observation and my uh, fight has been that there's been persistent problems in the committee that we have not been able to solve, and they have to do with <laughs> whose side is the committee on, or what is the committee working for, or who is the committee working for. I don't know how many times I've heard uh, city manager Barbara having to say to members of the committee that I am the one who supervises the police, not your membership and not your committee. Your committee is not set up to be a supervisory committee and evaluate the police on this, that, or another. Having a, <coughs> having a uh, Schwinn bicycle of the police, of the police chiefs, I think would take care of some of those issues. Another issue that was, that's been persistent and almost, you know, it, you, you couldn't, I was not able to solve, and that is that people would get on the committee and have their personal agendas, personal missions that had to do with outside interest, outside of Tacoma Park interest. Uh, that they would want to further in Tacoma Park as a feather in their caps so they could then take that feather and take it outside of Tacoma Park for one or another reason. Uh, I think a separate a committee of the chiefs would work more closely with city agendas and certainly would be focused on city issues. I don't think the chief is out to solve universal issues of the United States about one thing or another. Uh, his job is here and he's very much focused on it so that people on this committee would also be focused on those issues. Uh, I could go, <laughs> I have a whole list. I could talk about, but, but it's getting late, and I know that uh, Bruce doesn't like going late. Um, and I congratulate you. I've noticed that, you know, we used to go to t 11, 11.30, and that doesn't happen anymore. So <laughs> I congratulate you on that. Uh, so I, I'm very much in favor of having a chief's Schwinn bicycle, and, uh, and I think it would solve uh, some persistent problems that uh, <laughs> I have a feeling will continue to persist with the Public Safety Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, uh, my name's Thomas Nephew. Uh, I only recently became aware of this proposal, so I don't have uh, well-developed uh, response to it other than uh, to say that I think that the uh, Public Safety Committee ought to remain uh, in, in uh, existence as an independent body. That would be my... Uh, my first and main remark. I think that it's uh, 
it's important to have uh, independently appointed, independently, uh, I, I don't want to say minded because I'm sure everybody's independently minded, but uh, out with people with different perspectives on public safety issues, which I think um, can go beyond sidewalk and uh, stop sign and crime abatement per se and ought to also consider the trade-offs. As you know, I, I was a skeptic about the uh, license plate scanner and I do think that uh, that kind of issue would be one that, and that kind of perspective would be one that might be well addressed by a public safety committee such as is in existence. Uh, I think that would be difficult to do inside of a, uh, a body that is appointed or suggested by, uh, by Chief Ricucci, who is a, a very, I, I, I respect Mr. Ricucci and I, I enjoyed talking with him about that issue and I don't uh, have any qualms, but I do think as a matter of principle that you need to have an independent perspective on issues of, of that sort. I think that if that were part of the mandate for, if that were part of the mandate for such a committee, I think that would be a, a, a good step forward for the committee as well. I uh, have reservations about the um, body that uh, Mr. That, the, that is happening in Front Royal, maybe with great success. I uh, I don't know enough about it, so. I would, I would say that some of what is proposed, it seems to me, is kind of already the city council's job. And so I would think that there'd be some, there's some there could be some uh, question as to who do I go to. Do, shouldn't I go to Josh Wright instead of to uh, the, uh, this police uh, chief's advisory board for a question about a sidewalk or a, a stop sign, but, you know, I don't know enough about how to resolve those issues and whether this might be a, a, good, um, a good compromise or a good way forward for, the issue, for all of the kinds of issues that face Tacoma Park. So um, I'll leave it at that. I do think that the uh, uh, Public Safety Citizens and Fire Theory Committee should remain in, um, in existence. Thanks. Thank you. Bruce, just make one comment. Sure. Um, that uh, I'm happy, and I think all my council members, fellow council members, are happy to deal with any resident's issue or concern at any time. But I think it's only going to help us improve the service that we provide to residents, not just with the police department, but with other departments, if residents can have direct contact with um, the staff. and. One of the things you have to remember is the city council members are part-time positions. And, um, you know, I know a lot of us spend, you know, 20 hours a week, and most of that is responding to and solving constituents' issues. We're happy to do that, but we can get people better and faster service if they can engage in appropriate ways directly with the staff. And I think this is a great example of one of the opportunities to do that. Councilman McClay, did you have a comment? I did. I just wanted to say that um, I think I mentioned this to the council members, but didn't say it in public last time. That um, we have our sort of de facto person, who I think is about to speak, um, who seems to have already been anointed by the former chair, is the incoming chair, and we haven't even appointed him yet. And so I guess I would ask that you stop referring to him as the incoming chair before we actually decide whether or not we're going to. Uh, continue with the safety advisory committee or we appoint people and we let the whole array of new people that we appoint to the committee come together and select their own chair, which I want to say is absolutely no reflection on you. You seem like a great guy and are completely and totally engaged. I'm just going to ask you to stop doing that. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's it. That's certainly the impression. At our most recent meeting, I, I asked uh, 
I'm just asking you to stop, so please just stop. Okay. May, may I just say that, that that was prompted by at our last meeting. Um, we, we all concurred by consensus that assuming he is appointed, and I should qualify with that, assuming he is appointed, that we would be happy to see him proceed as chair. Obviously, there's two or three other people pending, too. They might get on or not. This is exactly the kind of conversation that I'm asking you to stop. So let's let's stop having yeah. that conversation. Actually, I, I, I concur with well, you, you so um, uh, because I could. <laughs> that's not important. What's important is, uh, you know, um, uh, Fritz referred to uh, Ward Six as the forgotten part, of, forgotten ward of the city. The forgotten part of the city is a lot bigger than Ward Six, <laughs> and. Um, I, I'm a strong believer in what the police chief is trying to do because I know that he respects all parts of the city. I mean, that's just Evan and the way he speaks about the city. And um, I'm actually in support of what I think what I hear from um, council members Snipper, Siemens, and Wright, um, and I, maybe even Robinson too, is that there should be two bodies. And I think that they, what they're, my comment would be, it, as a citizen of Ward 5, I'm not speaking as a de facto whatever, whatever. I'm speaking as someone who lives in this city. I'm speaking as someone who's when I moved into my apartment, my wife watched this dude get robbed, right, when we were moving in. And I'm like, that's crazy. So, I mean, you know, I don't care about, I don't even, I don't, that's not important. What's important is that if we can come up with a body that really does include participants from all over the city, and that's really what, what I wanted to say, um, the chief is engaged on this advisory committee project, and I think that that is the number one reason why you gotta you gotta support him doing it. Because if he wasn't, in, he's engaged. He's gonna go out and find people that represent all parts of the city, and that's really what we need. At the same time, I do believe that the public safety the public uh, safety committee should continue in existence, but I, I do think that it does need a mandate. It needs to have a little bit clearer direction, because we can't expect the the chief to come up with. Um, we can expect the chief to come up with, you know, the day-to-day -day recommendations on how to improve specific things, but that's sort of the larger global sense of telling the council of what we think you guys should think about. I think that helps the chief. <laughs> you know, um, the, 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 I know oversight isn't the right word, but the having that anytime you can engage the community more, uh, we need to do that, point blank. And I, what I especially would like to see from the chief is that he, in, instead of just putting things in the newsletter about getting members that he actively speaks with people about joining. Because I think that's really the key, is having someone who's engaged, who's talking to people in the community already, and getting people in the community to come to work with him. And that, I think, is how we can achieve some success. And that, I think, is how we can get some direction, too. So um, that's the main thing. I and mean, I do believe that the, the Citizens Committee should exist as a, as a sort of a policy advisory body just because there are larger issues while the chief's committee may, okay, this is what happens when this crime happened, or this is what happens when this accident happened. Like the chief's committee can, can get community input quickly. And I think that a public safety citizens advisory committee can focus on more of the loftier abstract ideas as sort of, as the council um, suggests. So that is what I would love to see, and I want to thank the chief and thank the council for all of you taking this issue so seriously, because I have to admit, sometimes I feel like y'all don't. And the fact that you're able to have this conversation go on for, you know, as long as it has, I, I, it, it encourages me, you know, uh, like I, I picked the right place to live. So that's it. Thanks. Okay, I would encourage anybody who has uh, spoken this evening or anybody else who's interested in this issue to... Uh, Talk to your council member, talk to me, and if you're interested in uh, participating in a chief's committee, if that's the direction he goes, uh, contact the chief, and the council will uh, figure out next steps on the Public Safety Citizens Advisory Committee, and we'll schedule something else. Can you the, the, uh, the discussion or, or no? Sure. Sure. Uh, again, my name is Naveed Nasser, Ward 6, uh, Hillwood Manor resident. Uh, basically, I think I find myself in agreement with uh, Councilmember Snipper, Councilmember Siemens, and Councilmember Wright that there's a place for um, uh, the Chief's Advisory Board and the uh, Public Safety Citizens Advisory Committee, and they don't have to, they can serve different functions and 
peaceably and harmoniously coexist, I think, within the city. Um, other than that, as far as the uh, meat and potatoes of it, I haven't been uh, actually on the board, so I can't comment on that as thoroughly and completely as uh, other members on both sides have. Um, personally, I did find uh, some of the comments a little uh, disturbing, the stuff about nefarious outside of Tacoma Park interests. I didn't understand that. And the uh, whose side is the committee on. I, hopefully we're all on, on the same side here. Um, and the uh, thing about um, uh, the city manager's job being to supervise the police and only her. Well, hopefully we all have some say, at least in, in uh, the way the police department handles itself. But that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thanks. Chief. As I said earlier, my proposal is just one of something I think that will um, better serve the community from the perspective for the department. Uh, I've worked with the Public Safety Committee for almost three years, and I will continue to work with it and support it. Uh, I think my proposal is something that will be – I'm looking for putting community policing in place. And if you listen to what Ms. Hart said, if you put it in place right, it continues. And one of the things I'm most proud of is what goes on in Front Royal today. And it's something that started a long time ago. And what I would like to see with this committee is that it's something that's in place. It doesn't matter if I'm the chief or whoever's the chief down the road. It will continue. And it's a partnership. And I think the thing that we don't need to lose here tonight is we have a good partnership with the committee. I'm just looking to improve it a little bit more. And I think my idea can work. And whether we – it wasn't offered to abolish anything. It was just another idea to put out there. And I do want the council support because – to answer one of the questions, in selecting people, I would come to each council member. I'd go to Barb. I'd go to the school authorities, the religious community, because you get a you get a mixture of everyone, and you try to represent the city. And I appreciate the comments of the last gentleman. We serve the entire city, and it's important. And I think sometimes, I think you know this, and I've said this more than once, some people in the city don't think that they're as important as others. Every person in the city is important to me and the safety of this community, and we will continue to work towards that goal. So what I'm hoping that, that came out of tonight is that we'll develop structures that will survive long after all of us are gone, that, that we can look back and say this was a good idea when we did it. Do it. And let us know how we can support you. Thank you. Okay. We're adjourned.